They say they don't have them. Would you like to prove your game, please? Okay, you want some to take the for Okay, this is my little bit of all. We're going to start with welcome and introductions. So let's start at the back of the room. Who is this man wandering around? <laughs> I'm John Joyce from the Roseman News. And I'm going to come back to John in a minute, in a minute so remember his name. We've got two people that just came in. Could you introduce yourself, please? Johnny Cagliaglio, I'm the director of the Tijuana uh, Home for Waiver uh, Ladies. Okay, we got two people in the room. We have a city council member that is a little bit recalcitrant, and now we have a resident, so welcome to Cal City. But if you two misbehave, you're going out in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh there actually, you are. <laughs> Okay, did I meet everybody? Okay, John, you want to tell them what you're doing, your recording, and where they can look at it afterwards? I certainly will, yes. The Roseman News has put up on YouTube all of our East Kern meetings since we joined three years ago. And it's helpful remembering people's names and what they do. And important things we include in the Roseman News online and in print. If you would like to view those YouTubes, you just go to our <coughs> site, which is 
Joyce Media Inc. J O Y C E Media Inc. No spaces, all one word. On YouTube, and that will take you to a list of all the ones we've done, plus many other news YouTubes that we do. We include in our newspapers a QR code by articles. And when we do a, an interview or a game, we have a, a print uh, paragraph about it. But then we also have <clears throat> a way to take your cell phone and scan that, and you can get the video like we have posted on YouTube. Thank you, John. He's just taught me something new. I knew about QR codes. I didn't know that they were printed in the newspaper and that I could go to an article. And I hope our inner city manager is listening to me because we're going to have a talk about what we can do as soon as we get in and get out of the horse and buggy cage. But with that said, thank you, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm going to do my best to be my one seventh of Richard. And my job is to keep the agenda moving. So that's all I'm doing. With that said, we have a California City update, and I'm squeezing in the B3K update with that. So I'm going to ask Dr. Jim Hart, Alexia Saveda, and Renee Rivera. Would you please tell everybody what's going on in California City? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to California City. We had a really nice day for you all the way back, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things we've got going on. The airport is we're working with several businesses trying to get back in, getting the appropriate businesses, renting the properties open there. We're also working on, we're talking to people about restaurant, getting that restaurant back open. So everything goes well. Maybe by June we'll have a really good update. Um, the numbers for the Air Force Air, Air, Air Force Base. Uh, right now, uh, there's a shortfall of housing. There's 860 shortfall people, uh, families looking for proper, looking for housing out there. There's also 261 single housing, you know, like single air, airmen kind of thing. So we've got some shortfalls on the housing, which is really kind of good news for like Miami and Oregon and Cal City. We need to start renting these folks and selling them properties. Um, Cal City Housing, the housing itself, uh, 2021 versus 2022, home sales have dropped 21%, which is not bad when you consider the rest of the country is in their 30s and 40s as far as home sales dropping. Uh, but 2021 versus 2022 sales of closed housing, 14% uh, increase in prices. So that kind of makes up for it's not selling quite as many. Uh, the chamber director, executive director, that's our Alexia, uh, she's working, uh, she's going to be leading an aerospace valley tour. And she's going to have did. to. I did. You I did. did. You did. Late October. I think she's. Oh, I thought it was this October. Okay. Anyhow, she's going to really talk about that as long as she's doing the B3, B3K as well. So, um, anyhow, Urgent Care, California City is getting their Urgent Care again. We've been working with them because the facility hasn't finished yet, I and mean, we're, we're, we're trying to help them along. But what we're doing is we have provided facilities, sorry, facilities for um, them to do training. So the Cal City Chamber Building has been used for nurses training over there so that they can, once they get finished, complete their project, they'll have all their training people going on. Uh, in the airport, on the inland port, we talked, uh, we have them out to our September record business group meeting. And, and they told us all about their plans and where they're going to put it. It was really quite interesting. And we're trying to build a good relationship with them because we want them to feel welcome to Cal City. <coughs> it's such an important part to the economic development of this area. Um, the next uh, business group will be on January 26th. And we have, we're doing hybrid meetings now. Instead of just doing in-person meetings or just hybrid or just internet meetings, we're doing hybrid. So 
they are invited to join us on the computer or you can join us in person. We're really nice people, so you should come and mm -hmm. these are fun. Anyhow, um, we're going to have a bigger sticky walk code. So this will get you into our meeting. So, you know, I, I, will, I will make sure to have this available for anybody who wants it. And that's all I have on my list. Thank you so much for coming in so today. Uh, you know, we couldn't pick a better day for everybody who travels. Alexi, you're up. Or Jim? No, Alexi. And Justin. And Justin. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I'd mean, mostly just like to steal the spotlight and try to <laughs> we're, so, we're team members. Um, I'm B3K. And what's he? Besides I, Beardy. <laughs> um, we're we're going to get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, and very quick update. Before I came here, I got photos of the lobby of the urgent care. And I believe we've got a phone number that anybody can call if they want to know what services they're providing and they can call between nine and six i think and uh, I, renee did i share that night but you have a phone number yes and i'm willing really to sell it to anybody who comes up to <laughs> so if anyone is interested Welcome ask, to ask, ask, ask renee but their lobby is is open and um, they they are just about ready to start operating okay so i say let me get the phone number for anybody who's interested urgent care cal city 818 651 6608. 818 651 6608. Thank you. Nice and good. Okay, B3K. For those of you who don't know what it is, let me give you a really quick introduction. And since I always get the name wrong, I wrote it down so that I get it right. What does B3K stand for? stands for a better Bakersfield and boundless Kern. It actually came about in 2020. Uh, the county uh, partnered with the Brookings Institute, hired them, and they came in and did research. Off that research and the data that they found, they identified economic clusters that the county should be uh, capitalizing on. And those clusters are advanced manufacturing, business systems, energy and carbon management, entrepreneurship, and aerospace. And that leads into what I'm doing with B3K. I do have a little bit of a history because I was working with the county and for a year was very specifically working with B3K. As of the new year, I now work for them. And I have, I am a program coordinator for both aerospace and talent industry. And aerospace, we are in the middle of the aerospace valley. Now this is a Kern County initiative, but in this case we cross the border into Los Angeles County because this aerospace cluster goes all the way from Ridgecrest through Mojave Air and Space Force, Edwards Air Force Base, and then to the satellite Edwards Air Force Base, Plant 42 down in Hall. <coughs> Therefore we cross the county line. Have to for it to make sense. And uh, the, I was part of the workshop where we identified goals, and we are working on those goals, and one very specifically segues into the other thing that I'm doing, and that is talent industry. And we are definitely making headway. We're working with uh, our industry partners on getting data on how then our education partners can be fulfilling their needs. And so in my case, I'm going to be working across all five economic sectors, working with them on talent to industry. And really, what is the ultimate goal? Uh, we, it's deep prosperity, but it is creating jobs. And when it comes to talent, we want to make sure that we are providing what we need to the kids here in our, in our area so that they can be hired to these amazing jobs that we literally have in the backyard. So that we don't have to be recruiting, so that we are growing the talent locally. 
Um, and speaking of, if when you leave, you will see there is a welding trailer that is parked in the parking lot. That is a mobile welding classroom. This is something the chamber worked on. I think it was, took us about two and a half years. That is a mobile welding classroom. It has four welding bays in the back, a classroom in the front. It can take eight students, eight students, one instructor, five weeks, and they then take the exam and they do pass and they get their American Welding Association card. The certificate is one thing, that card is what gets them welding jobs. And that's happening right there. Um, and Justin, <laughs> Justin is working on entrepreneurship, so you have the floor. Um, so I've, uh, I've been coming to these meetings for uh, I think a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. um, Generally representing uh, Kern Hill Co-work in Kern River Valley, so I'll probably stand back up here in a few minutes and talk about Kern Valley. But um, as, as part of that, um, I've gotten connected with, uh, with Kern UC, with C-Core Foundation, and been really uh, getting involved in, uh, in, in helping to build systems and, and programs for uh, those supporting our entrepreneurs. And I was really excited, um, just a few weeks ago, I started with B3K. Um, I'm a uh, project manager focusing on the of entrepreneurship and business services. Um, and, and just to reiterate, like B3K, it's about the economic resiliency. Um, and so when it comes to entrepreneurship, one of the, the leading factors that really shows the economic resiliency in the area is the number of young firms, uh, companies that are under uh, five years old. And so one of our goals is to try to not only increase the number of, of startups and young firms, but uh, Brookings Institute also, um, in their research, identified that lately we have been doing pretty well at creating new startups, but they're not lasting long enough, and they're not paying well enough. So um, we not only want to create startups, we really want them to thrive, and we want to provide them uh, with the infrastructure and support they need to really um, you know, create these fast growth and big companies that uh, <clears throat> would really help uh, you know, anchor our economy. So, um, with the entrepreneurship pillar, uh, we're trying to do one thing at, at really well at a time. Uh, our first initiative is the uh, CoStarters program. Um, and I am also working with C-Core. Uh, the CoStarters program is a 10-week entrepreneurship uh, accelerator. It's a really fantastic program. We did a pilot program up in uh, Kernville, at Kernville Cohort, uh, April of last year. It was so successful, we did another cohort last year. We did another cohort to Hatchby. And now we're working on expanding to the rest of Kern County, specifically the outlying communities. Uh, we've got a lot of support systems inside of Bakersfield. We're not seeing a whole lot of support systems outside. And so building up this uh, capacity within each of these outlying uh, communities to be able to uh, create this entrepreneurial ecosystem of, uh, and community of entrepreneurs that support each other is really one of our, um, one of our main goals. Um, <coughs> Also, business services is another area that I, I, I'm just now jumping into. And uh, business to business services, what we're talking about. Specifically, we want to uh, try to invest and transform as much as possible um, to business services that can trade outside of our area. So where we can specialize in creating these uh, business services, whether it's engineering firms or accounting or, or insurance or whatever, uh, that can pull in money from outside the county and outside of the area, because that's what's going to help our economy. So I'm just now getting started on that. Um, I'll probably have a big record in that next month. Um, but yeah, and uh, you're, you're getting a little bit of sneak preview because it hasn't been actually announced that we started yet. There'll, there'll be a press release coming out. Um, we, we've uh, both started with the 3 k and then also a super project manager <coughs> as well. Um, so yes, thoughts? and it seems like we have a bit of a theme going today. <laughs> um, QR code will take you to the website on the if you want to know more about it. So, some up front and some in the back. Speaking as one of the senior members of the room, I think we need a short training video for QR codes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to give you a QR code to the training video. You might. <laughs> there you go. And I have a city manager. Do you have something to say in your four months here with this? You, did you learn anything about us? <laughs> you know, like I said, I've been here about four months. It's been a, a great opportunity to work with the council and 
the staff, you know, I can say everybody is dedicated to doing the things that are right for the city and the community. And it's been a real pleasure to work with them. As I got rolling on some things, there are a number of things that need to get started that we're working on. Let's see, I've said some of it. Uh, the airport's an area that we know is important and we're trying to make that grow. We're working with the development community. There appears to be more interest now in, in housing. I've had a few discussions with <coughs> people who are interested in bringing housing and we know there's a shortage of housing here in the community, especially for our military families. So we're looking at helping to try to meet those needs. It'll take a little bit of time, but we're encouraging that. I'm working with uh, developers who are doing that. New council members, and we're trying to bring them on board so they understand uh, what's going on in the, in the city and what's going on within the city operation itself to bring them online. And we're starting those next week, and Councilmember Smith is one of those that we're going to be um, correcting his thinking on. So <laughs> we're, we're going to uh, we're going to be doing that. But it's it's been a real pleasure uh, to be here and uh, work with the council. We've got a lot of challenges, but we've got groups that are interested in helping with those challenges to help make the city grow and to develop into what it can be. So thank you. And I will transition into the next item by saying I have a vision. I Dave's going to tell us about China Lake Alliance and Ridgecrest. We've heard Alexia talk about E3K, and I see California City sitting right here as a hub in the midst of what can be an incredible development for Eastern Kern. So if any of you know things that we can share our knowledge and shortcut our learning curve, I think that's the biggest reason that we have this group coming together, so that we can all work together and we can all benefit. Now, we get to the unscripted part. This was supposed to be the economic development activity and marketing update for East Kern Economic Alliance and Kern EDC. But I understand that out of job protection and wanted to make sure she is so getting me in trouble right now. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you what I know. It's the story on the street. <laughs> Richard started the report <laughs> to Boston with it. So we're going to do the best we can. All right. So we were taken off the agenda mostly to protect me because I'm an accountant and I'm just here to serve Richard's place. So. We have the Career and STEM Expo, which is in your packet, and the Save the Date for the State of the County, and those are our updates for Kern EDC. We're currently today, actually, what I'm really excited about is for KEDS. We are releasing a program that Bank of America has sponsored. It is an internship program that works with our local manufacturers in Kern County and in Bakersfield, and it will pay for a certain I think it's a 12-week program for an intern to come work for them because we've learned that interns work better if they're paid. Mm -hmm. And so Bank of America is our first sponsor to sponsor them to actually get paid for their internship this summer. Um, all the details haven't been worked out yet, but it is the internship tonight at the math meeting. <laughs> so you said something that I'm not sure everybody in the room knows. Current EDF, what does it stand for and who are they? Current Economic Development Foundation. And it's part, um, Richard is actually the director of it as well as the current EDC. I'm here to represent the current EDC, and the current EDC is actually NAP, which is the Manufacturers <laughs> Association. The foundation is partnering with the EDC because Bank of America actually donated the $100,000 for the internships to the foundation. So as you can see, we all wear many hats. And those mini hats give us lots of perspective. So that's part of our value. Yes, I'm not just a little bit. <laughs> but if I call you, it's probably because you are. She's a pretty face. <laughs> Small Business Development Center. I don't see Cal State taking the in the room. Are they here? No. Anybody know what's going on with it? OK, got it. we'll fill that out. We'll figure out how to do that. Kern County, I have District 1 and <coughs> District 2. We'll go in the airport. <laughs> Typically, we defer if one of the elected is here, but today you just get staffers. Oh. I'm not yes, saying a little cool. biased. Yeah, we're. You're the ones that really know what's going on. Don't tell them that. <laughs> so, 
I have to say, first of all, um, please pass along to Supervisor Scribner. He did a phenomenal job this year as chair of the board. Um, really led the way on a lot of things. Um, meetings went smoothly. A lot of the initiatives that the board took um, under his leadership are really setting us up as a county to prepare for the future. So, and the reason that is, is obviously Sacramento has different ideas about our economic development than maybe we would like, and they want to curtail some of what we try to do, whether it's oil and gas or water, but at the same time, we still have to forge forward. So the, the county this year, the board has done a lot of, um, made a lot of petitions, they've made a lot of advancements, their success this year is actually all of ours. I want to share some of those with you so that you are fully aware of where we're going. You can see kind of the trajectory of the county. It's, it's not as, as far as the budget is concerned, as we talked about earlier this year, it's not as, uh, not as high as we, we would obviously like it to be, to, to be able to do more. But we still are able to do a lot with what we have. So one of the, one of the first things I want to point out is um, that was just done uh, this week. The board approved a 22% increase for our detention deputies in the Sheriff's Department. So what does that mean? Well, it's an addition to a few months ago, the board actually approved a 2,000 a month housing stipend for our unincorporated areas. So we are, we are well aware at the county where, because we, we communicate very well with the Sheriff, where our recruitment needs are and we have significant recruitment needs. The reality is, it's getting more and more difficult to compete with other counties for law enforcement, so we're having to get creative and proactive. So that's the need for the 22% increase in the housing study. We've done, um, our communications department has done significant amounts of recruitment um, projects as far as videos and uh, initiatives in that area, in the arena, so that we could reach others across the country. The reality is also we're not the only county that's having this issue. Other counties, even across the nation, are having a similar issue. Recruitment for law enforcement is down. And I'm sure most of you, those who especially work in your individual municipality, know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, some of the other things that we're doing this year specifically, um, the board was really instrumental with our public works department. Uh, COVID taught us a lot of lessons with um, trash abatement, graffiti, and, and the board is, has taken steps to make sure that we are addressing that. We are still on a referral basis for a lot of those issues, and, and believe you me, we are getting those referrals. In fact, I just looked at, for District 1, we have 162 open cases for code enforcement currently, and about 82 of them or 83 of them are from, from one particular area, and it's one of our unincorporated areas. Now, what does that mean? Well, for us, that just means we, we know where we have to focus a lot of our energy. So, some of the things that the board has done, um, whether it's through um, grant funding opportunities, uh, we, we know there's not gonna be the revenue streams in the future that, as there has been with ARPA funding. However, they're, they're going to have to get creative, and they, they are, about how to address those. Um, this year, specifically in District 1, we had over 1,000 illegally dumped mattresses, actually 1,100 to be precise, and uh, out of those, um, 1,009 were recycled. So our mattress recycling program that we've only had for a few years now, right, Laura? It, it is really um, benefiting because those mattresses obviously get recycled and put into different programs, donations, things of that nature. Um, homelessness is obviously something that a lot of us are having to, to, um, to mitigate, and, and it's, it's a triage. It's not just a housing issue, it's not just an economic issue, it's, it's mental behavioral health. Um, we are still on par with opening up a new facility, mental health facility. Uh, we know that the state is going to have what are called airports. I'd like to have a more, much more in-depth problem. I'll talk to Richard about having our behavioral health director come in and talk about where those are going to be. The reality is the state is doing pilot projects with this right now. 
and the care courts are specifically for those with mental health crises and issues. And so it, it, it's very separate from drug and opioid addiction. I will make that clear. But with that, those folks are put into kind of something similar to family court. And this has to do with conservatorships. But this is going to talk about and help us deal with folks that we need to get help. We want to help them. This is not about rounding up folks. This is about getting folks the help that they need. We have services to provide them, but this, the status quo right now is it's on their, their uh, initiative. So this, this would change that. The state of California is looking to change that because it has a problem. So that's, that's coming down the pipe. We're preparing for that. Um, I'll, and remind, I'll remind you, a lot of that comes from realignment funding, so it's not taxpayer funding. Um, so realignment funding is um, basically um, just a different revenue stream that the state uses to help local municipalities and local counties take care of this. Um, Measure K did pass. So Measure K, for those of you who live in the unincorporated areas, this will significantly impact you. This will provide more county services to you. This, this will not deal with the incorporated areas. So there's a good portion of the unincorporated areas in Eastern Kern. So Measure K is going to allow us to provide more county services. It'll be siphoned primarily for first responders, law enforcement, that, that arena. The Sheriff's Department is um, probably a major focus with that. Obviously, we are in um, we're at a time period, and, and this happens, where our deputies, there's a, a good portion of them that are retiring. So what does that mean? We're going to have to fill those spots, fill those vacancies. And the reality is, we went through something similar 20 years ago. If you can do the math, that's what's going on. So we're having, a, you know, 20 years ago, we had a significant number of the, the same thing. So we repeat this, but we're trying to fill these vacancies. We're doing, like I said before, the $2,000 a month housing site and, and various different initiatives to try to fill those vacancies. Parks and recreation. This, you know, as, as part of bringing more folks to uh, the more beautiful parts of Eastern Kern, um, specifically two parks in Ridgecrest this year. Uh, Supervisor Peters was instrumental in getting some of our federal funding allocated to Leroy Jackson Park and Petrobras Park. These are two main recreational areas in Ridgecrest that we wanted to focus on, and it's it's a benefit. The other area is we actually were able to for District One. Supervisor Peters was able to get more funding for staffing because one of the one of the things that we went to and talked with our Parks and Rec Department, they they really did have to fill in some vacancies themselves to be able to maintain parks that we already have. So those are some major um, ground level things that we've been able to take care of. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to talk about District Two. But does anybody before I finish, anybody have any questions? So no, that those numbers were actually district, just district one. Oh. So yes, so, so and to be honest with you, you know, in the area, uh, unincorporated areas of Ridgecrest, whenever we actually do that program, I believe it typically, even in the incorporated areas, we still. Facilitate, facilitate that. If not, I'll, I'll check on that. But that I was actually, I, there was a little bit of shock value with that number for me. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can definitely bridge that. Yeah. Any other questions? Good afternoon. I'm Laura Lake Wyatt, District Director for Kern County Supervisor Zach Scooter, District 2. Um, in Richard's absence, I was sitting there desperately trying to think of a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even come up one. Sorry. Um, so I've got a couple things to touch on. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Joe said about the detention officers. Um, by law, the sheriff's department is required to staff jails first. So the detention officers' pay increase is very significant because it allows those staffing in the jails increase enough, fill that staffing position, so some of those senior detention officers 
that desire to be out in the field and on road patrol in the communities of East Kern allows them to do that. So it'll take some time, but we'll, we're going to eventually see some staffing levels in the field come up as a result of that decision. So it's a really big deal. Um, a lot of you uh, coming to these meetings, you've heard Richard, you've heard Supervisor Scrivener, Director of Planning, Lorelei Oliott, talk about carbon capture. <laughs> carbon capture is something that's brand new to me. I don't know if it's new to all of you, but um, I want to announce that starting tomorrow, if you go to currentplanning.com, there's going to be a link for a free webinar that's going to describe, explore all of the new carbon management technologies that are out there, what kind of job opportunities these industries are going to provide. Um, so I brought some flyers, I'll leave them at the back table. But again, starting tomorrow, if you go to currentplanning.com, there will be a link for the free webinar so that you can participate in that if you choose to do so. So I will leave these at the back table. Um, I want to talk about parks. Uh, we're going to be really, really busy in District 2 this year. Um, Supervisor Scrivener did a press release back in May, talked about almost $9 million going into park improvements within his district. There's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes, so it didn't necessarily get off to a running start, right? Because you've got to do drainage analogy, you've got to do planning, you've got to do soil testing, all that kind of stuff has to be done behind the scenes. But now we are so excited because we're actually seeing some work. So uh, the pool in Rosemont at Wilford Park, they've started construction. That is going to see almost a million dollars worth of improvements. Uh, a lot of it was accessibility, ADA compliance, upgrading the restrooms, the decking around the pool had some earthquake damage. So all the decking is currently gone. It's just dirt right now and they're reworking the slopes of the walkways, going in and out, making sure it's accessible from handicap parking, things like that. So that work is currently going on. Uh, last week, uh, we met with the skate park designer for a brand new skate park in Borom. This is a half million dollar, five to 6,000 square foot skate park. It is phenomenal. We are so excited. We had a lot of the local teenagers and kids there that are skaters dreaming. Can we have this kind of ramp, that kind of ramp? I understand the thing they were saying. <laughs> Something about a rainbow rail, I don't know. I don't skate. Rainbow rail? Sure. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, it was a great meeting. So the designer, uh, the contract for the design is with Push Parks. They're out of San Diego. They do parks all over the country, so we're super excited to have them. They're going to take all this input back to the drawing board in about a month. We're going to go back to the same community group, engage them again, see if they want to move some stuff around. Um, they're going to put some custom touches. So if you look at a video on YouTube, you're going to know they're skating at the Moron Park. So they're really excited about that. Rosebud is also going to get a new skate park. <laughs> uh, we meet, a uh, preliminary meeting I believe is at the end of this month for Rosemont, and that will be at the park on Glendower. Uh, it will be very similar, but again, we're going to put a custom stamp so you know you're skating at the Rosemont Park. They don't want all the parks to be cookie cutter, right? So we learned in the meetings, these parents, they're driving their kids to Apple Valley to skate, or Palmdale, or, you know, all over. So we want to know that these District 2 skate parks are recognizable. There's something a little bit different about each one of them to attract those parents to drive their kids, right? Because what happens? Then they eat at our restaurants, right? They're exposed to our communities. So it, it, it's really a ripple effect. So we're super excited. Mojave, there's a big grant going into Mojave. Their, their park is going to have a big facelift. Um, a lot of it is going to be drainage issues, uh, trees and shrubs that are more of a windbreak for the park, uh, you know, a multi-use field for soccer, t-ball, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So we're super excited. You guys are going to see some dirt movement. I'll try to keep everybody posted on social media. Um, that's my report for today, unless anybody has questions. Yes, Renee? I'm just curious, how did, how, how did the 
Carl, what, what went into the decision of what part she would be doing? So uh, a lot of it is grant money. So it had to do with demographics and applying for the grants and whether the grant would apply to that particular area. Um, and really need. It's really a need. Mojave, for example, I don't want to pick on you, but you're sitting right in front of me, so I can't okay, go ahead. Um, if you walk through, you know, we don't get a lot of rain, right? I mean, recently we have, thank God, but normally we don't. They have massive drainage issues. There's an area where there, there's no grass, it's completely dead, it's just dirt, and you take three steps and you're in a swamp. So there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. And it's spread all over District 2. We'll be looking forward to doing that, that part when the work starts. And yeah, see, it's exciting when you actually see a tractor show up and yes. things happening, right? And all this stuff behind the scenes, everybody's like, they're not doing nothing, they're lying. Laura, Lynn, and Joe, just because we've got some residents in the room, can you explain Mojave, Rosamond, I'm not even sure more of them. They're a county. They're unincorporated. They're unincorporated county. Yes. And so can you explain this line between an incorporated city and an unincorporated? So we're sitting in Cal City. Correct. Why we are on the outside of the wonderful things you're doing. Just so you're in well because yeah, so you're your own municipality. So you have your own funding stream, your own body of government. So that's really, I guess, would be the biggest difference. Aren't incorporated, they don't have a city council, they don't have a city manager, they have Zach as their manager, right? So, um, that's really the main difference is, you is the funding stream, I would say. If you want to be even more confused, you should look at a map of, greater, of the city of Bakersfield and look at all the <coughs> pocketed islands that yeah. the county is maintains versus the city of Bakersfield. One, one of the things that we're looking into is city of bakersfield and this would actually help these turn is if the city of bakersfield annexed which the state of california has actually created laws about island annexations so if you're a planning nerd like i am sometimes and you look at how the cities are drawn out annexations and incorporations are a new thing for california because if the city of bakersfield actually annexed a large portion of those islands if not all of them they would be the fifth largest state or fifth largest city in the state which would change their revenue streams, grant funding, mechanisms for how they, how they um, are, how to operate. And it would alleviate what the county has to do in those pockets. So now the city of Bakersfield. It's who main, it, that, that's what determines who maintains your public goods. So whatever you share, roads, transportation, uh, services, um, anything down to anything that, we, that, that your taxes go into, that's what you're talking about, the city of of California City versus County of Kern is responsible. So there's, what we have a lot of times is folks call us up and say, hey, can you um, can you fix this road? It's, it's got a lot of problems. Well, the first thing we do is, whose responsibility is it to maintain it? Is it within the county's jurisdiction or the city's? Thank you. Yeah. Really okay. And I'm gonna look to Tehachapi when we get that far to explain, because you've got the same pockets. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think a lot of times, to we lay people as residents, I don't see a difference. I just say, look what they have, I want that. Mm -hmm. But in order to get that, we have to understand where the lines are. Any questions? Okay. Thank well, you. One, one other thing I do want to notify everyone is we have a new supervisor on board. Uh, Jeff Flores, who took a District 3 seat in uh, his election, and Mike Magger, his supervisor Magger is now Still, I, I think he still runs his, uh, he has a business at Purdue. Well, he's, uh, he's an accountant, so he has a whole, he has his, his business, but he is a retired supervisor now. So now we have Jeff Flores, who is now the chair. His first year on the board, and he's the chair. Which, we just push him off the edge of the right? Go for it. That's a challenge. Yeah. Get it. <laughs> Forum. I know we've got real tension in there. She had to leave. Oh, no. She had to leave. Okay, she's coming back, so we'll move forward on. Okay, Kern River Valley, Justin. Are you guys tired of the city yet? I'll turn this side so you can get a little bit of a different view. Um, 
I already talked a lot, so I'll keep it brief. Um, first of all, the uh, the rain that we've been getting has been phenomenal uh, for us. Uh, for those of you who uh, haven't spent much time in the River Valley, a large part of our local economy is dependent on how much snow there is up on Mount Whitney. There's snow on Mount Whitney. We get the snow melt in the spring, and that feeds our whitewater industry. It fills our lake. It, 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 you can really see the difference in the area coming alive. Um, both the greenery, but also prosperity in years where we have um, <clears throat> have a lot of uh, you know snow up in the mountains. Um, that's one of the things that we're uh, we're working on trying to. I'm personally making a mission to try to uh, have a little bit more economic resiliency, so we're not so dependent on the snow now, Whitney, But it is certainly welcome. I, uh, I just checked. Right now, for the Southern Sierras, uh, we are at about 267 uh, percent snowpack compared to where we normally are uh, <clears throat> at this time of year. And we are, we've already reached 124 percent of where we usually are by the end of the season, April 1st. So um, I think that's good news. Everybody in California is really excited about that. I know that there's a lot of water issues going on right now, uh, but you're, we're already uh, seeing the Lake of go up. In fact, in the middle of the last storm, the water level went from three to 500 cubic feet per second to what, what was about 17,000? Yeah, 17,000 was more Seven, than the other day. 500 to 17,000, that's the, the chain on the bottom uh, in the middle of the storm. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, Whiskey Flat Days, if anybody hasn't been there, <laughs> come join us. Uh, President's Day weekend, uh, February 17th through the 20th. Um, I'll be out there. Uh, come by, check out the co working space. We'll have, a, we'll have a little open house. Um, we'll also have a, a booth out there talking about uh, co starters and and really recruiting a lot of our entrepreneurs. Um, <clears throat> Fishing Derby is uh, going to be April 1st through June 4th. That's uh, um, they're really excited about that. That's a that's a big event. It's a big draw. Um, usually, when you're driving around the lake, you'll just see the whole lake is just surrounded by fishermen during that uh, that time. Um, and just to kind of bring it real quickly back to Coast Stars, I keep I keep bringing that up. I'm really excited about that program. Um, but one thing I didn't mention is that. Uh, we are in a stage right now where we're wanting to bring it out to more and more communities. Um, if that's something that you want to have a conversation with, uh, we, we've gotten a good amount of Eastern Kern representation between Kern Valley and uh, Tehachapi. Um, and so we're, we're, we're working on getting uh, some cohorts started in, in West Kern. But if anybody wants to talk about bringing uh, programs like this into your community, talk to myself or talk to Daniel Patterson. Um, we'd love to figure out how we can really support the entrepreneurs um, you know, out here in uh, Space Valley too, um, and uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Any yeah. questions? Questions for Jessica? Yeah, we got the first questions. <laughs> I thought I saw more on she did, in, but she's so we'll go on to Mojave. Okay. Well, we all know Mojave is a hospitality business, being on the main drag for that of Los Angeles, where people go and skiing and everything, and. Been a number of things and improvements in our area we wanted to talk about. Of course, last year we had the freeway completed. That was a welcome addition for those traveling through and also the locals who have to drive to Lancaster all the time. That was a great job the state did with that freeway. Really appreciated that uh, community. Uh, we've lost uh, quite a few businesses over the years. We had a number of issues, but we've had some improvements uh, recently. Uh, businesses opened up. We had Starbucks. We had a place called Frank. Plain broiler opened up. They have 161 franchises. We're the newest one in Mojave. And the reason we got that franchise is because the owner of all those businesses travels all the time through Mojave and goes up skiing up at Mammoth, and he said, This would be an ideal place for his business. So that's how we got that business. And they reopened up another one called the Works up on the north end of Mojave. And here recently, uh, Ringo Strong, RSI of Mojave, uh, Chevron dealership basically they deliver fuels for the area. They're in the process of purchasing the old Mission Bank, and it was vacant for a long time. And uh, their goal <coughs> is to open for a number of smaller businesses, whether it be a lawyer's office, uh, accountants, what have you. And the front end, they hope to open that up to be used by a credit union or a small bank, because we don't need that big building there, in Mojave, for a bank. It's, it's, it just doesn't work. So they're in escrow right now, and I think they're trying to uh, 
work with a couple of firms in the area that have credit unions in back. So hopefully we'll get something going there. I know Mojave, we haven't had one for a year. We really feel bad about that. And Roseman, of course, they've gone without a bank or a credit union for eight years now. So hopefully this will get things moving for both our communities. Uh, we had the old Ford dealership that was purchased by an organization and they're setting up shop there, mechanic shop, and, uh, tire shop, I believe. And uh, we've had some improvements on K Street. I think with the help of uh, District 2 Supervisor Gloria, probably, we had one of our old buildings that was in derelict building for a long time. It was a burnout laundromat. Well, they've gone in and repaired that and been ready for a new business. So we're really excited about seeing that happen. We have another business on K Street is, has opened up Beauty Parlor and it was vacant for uh, some time and uh, also with the help of the county. Uh, the graffiti issues we had in Mojave. We had a local fellow by the name of Leon Ryder working with the county and graffiti and they're always fixing graffiti when it comes up and try to get rid of it as fast as possible. And with the help of the county, we've been able to do that. Uh, of course, with all positive things, there's always some things we need to work on and we're we're still hoping to get some more street lights in, in uh, downtown Mojave on K Street. Those things have been worked on for some time in the county. So hopefully this next year we can get uh, some activity on street lights. And uh, again, we appreciate the work the county's doing on that, but there's a lot of things involved. So, housing, yeah, thank you. Uh, housing issue was brought up earlier, and that is an issue out here. And we, this issue we talk about in Mojave ever since I've been on the board for nine, 10 years. There have been a couple of people that have uh, approached the community about possibly putting in some housing and they were interviewing the big businesses in and around Mojave, what they might need for apartments or homes. So we hope to see something happen in the future, but there's a lot that goes on with the vote for planning and getting new homes built in the area. So let's see. Maybe. Yes, and again on the park, we're looking forward to that. As really good news for that you talked about in the parks. So we'd be really we excited. Love parks. <laughs> yeah, we'll be really excited to see those the heavy equipment come in very easily. Thank you. And I can't resist this. I'm sorry. I'm a Sagittarian and I've got real heroes. Behind every good man from Mojave, there is a woman. <laughs> 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 I notice you can be see. Do you have anything? She's the secretary of our chamber of commerce, and I'm just sitting in the president's spot, so this is normal. <laughs> what do you got here? Uh, uh, really nothing other than just to reiterate and emphasize that um, there is um, there, there's energy, there's rumor, there's you know, and we're we're waiting, we're wanting to you know, light the match. Um, whatever the we as the chamber can do to um, push, we're you know, we're willing to do that. Um, so um, yeah, so I have some ideas about you know where we apply the match. <laughs> we'll be happy to hear it. Um, yeah, uh, so. Uh, there's there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of a lot of potential there, but you know, there hasn't been a new home built in Mojave in 25 years, something like that. I mean, really. It's, so uh, you know, those of you who are more worried about, well, can Mojave take the overflow of the people coming in? No, we have no housing. We're, we've got land. But we've got, we need a developer who's willing to take a chance on, on, on being able to put up some homes that those 4,000 workers who come into the Mojave's Air and Space Board in the morning and then leave at 4 o'clock in the afternoon taking those nice fat paychecks in the phone. <laughs> We, you know, we could use some housing that might want to keep them, keep them in the area. That's a very powerful statistic. I mean, just take a deep breath and let that soak into everybody. Like, no new housing in 25 years. And I believe it was at the last meeting, 
that we talked about, or maybe it was at the Mojave Air and Space Board, that a lot of these engineers, the people working at that level, they don't want to spend any time commuting. They really and truly want to live where they work. So in actuality, they like to spend most of their time computing on a bicycle that don't to work. <laughs> That's their commute they want. Okay, they want a bicycle commute. Okay, so East Curtin County, a bicycle commute. <laughs> yeah. We just need bike paths. Okay, Oron, please give us an update. What you know, or Rio Tinto, whatever you want to talk about. I'm going to do Rio Tinto. Thank you. So we are. Um, Mary Beth gave me some notes before I came here, so. Um, we are going to do the uh, state of the business. Um, so, if anybody. Suites, 
well. So a lot of hospitality, a lot of developments with that kind of thing. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Joe, <coughs> improvements to our parks, especially the Leroy Jackson Sports Complex. Um, part of that is funded through the Clean California grant from the state, and then as well as some of the, the support from the county coming through the federal level. So that will be a really robust, um, it'll transform that area, make it really nice. We're going to get some new tennis court lights, um, resurface those, and there's a lot of um, implements that go into that project. So it'll be exciting to see that. We're in the design phase currently, so um, Ron, help me out here. I think we're looking at about another two years before. But another year before we break ground. Oh, so break ground another year, that'll be exciting. Let's see. We also have a bunch of public works projects going on. So some huge sewer and road repairs, I think it's $8 million worth coming up. So uh, right now we have a big project going on on the board. They're working on like, repairing the sewer, and then they'll go back and do the road repairs after that's done. So that's a big issue, issue big project going on right now. Um, and we've got a couple other public works projects lined up. As, as most of you know, Measure Key did pass. That was Bridge Crest's um, local tax measure. So with that funding, being able to come in, we'll be able to do a lot more um, community events. We're really interested in improving our quality of life in Ridge Crest. That's what our residents have expressed to us is what they desire. So um, as part of that, and it kind of leads into economic development as well, as we're interested in kind of revitalizing our downtown area, Balsam Street. And one of the ways we want to kind of bring some attention to that, get people down there, is we're going to be planning um, the first of what we hope will be many community events. We're calling it a night on Balsam. Um, the first one will just be very simple, just to get it off the ground. We're thinking just food, wine, and um, some music. So we've reached out to some of the vendors in Tehachapi um, to see if there's interest in coming down there for that event. And we are have a tentative date of February 10th. So we're still waiting to confirm a few things before we go completely public with that. But I just wanted to let you guys know we're looking to do a lot more um, fun things kind of with this money. And a big part of that, as well with that quality of life component, is we're looking to redo our community pool. So um, we know Rich Press residents have been saying that we don't have a pool, and it's been something that we wanted to do for a long time. So now with this Measure Q funding, it's something that we're committed to moving forward with. Uh, I know Ron has already been having talks with some consultants about getting the design phase going and hopefully breaking construction on that here really soon, 2024, right? And that's, that's the timeline at least. So uh, we've got a lot going on. I'm sure I'm probably missing <coughs> that could probably be talked about. One thing I will mention because I'm kind of the trash person in Ridge Crest is we started our bi-weekly collection of organics. So we're getting a lot of public feedback. Um, we obviously know it just began, so there's going to be some kinks we have to work out. Um, a lot of the education and outreach that we're continuing to do with the public. So stay tuned. We'll have updates as that continues to roll out. And I'm sure a lot of you are dealing with similar um, programs in your town. So if you're unincorporated, I'm sure it's coming. So, but um, that's kind of where we are right now. I'm a strong feel. Is there anything I should throw out that I should touch in on? That I should do really well. Okay. Well then, uh, let me know if there's any questions or want more information on specifics. I have a question. Yes. Ashley? Yes. I'm going to ask you a big question. Yes. The last time we had a meeting, Megan, I think, had done a town hall meeting the night before. Yes. I know there is recycling. What have you learned in the last few months about what this means and what we have to prepare for? Well, I, I can say from, from the city, my, my personal perspective with the city is we've had, today we've had two town halls. Um, we had one in September and one in December because we knew with the program rolling out in January, we wanted to give our public the opportunity to you know, ask questions, get the information, express their concerns, or just vent if that was the case. Um, so I think what we, what I find personally is no matter how much outreach we try to do, we try to hit social media, website, mailers, daily independent, you know, news review, all that kind of stuff, we really try to get the message out there. But what I think I've learned, which I don't know, I think we kind of all expected it, is that people don't, don't always pay attention, so we're getting a lot of calls about people saying, this is the first I've ever heard about this, why didn't you try harder to reach out to your citizens and let them know this is coming? Um, so if anybody has any recommendations of how we can improve our outreach, because of course we're always looking to, to get better. Just not when everybody's doing it. So right now is we're basically doing personal calls to so people as they call in. Now I had a good 30 minute conversation with somebody before I came down here today, and I've got three more voicemails I need to return calls. So um, that direct outreach is, is definitely a component. But if anybody has any ideas, they've done 
like stuff like this and outreach and you know, hey, I know there's some talk right now about doing a website and app development. And so um, that's something that we're also interested in doing is like putting our apps and websites and stuff. So Your good angle. Good yeah, angle. whatever. There you go. Is that good? That's yes, good sir. Angle. Okay. <laughs> Roseman has uh, three items of interest. First, our wastewater treatment plant is working. A year late, fifteen million dollars spent, but it's actually processing water, putting it in the ground, which means Roseman then can pump out. Got much more water out of the desert. That's really, really important to us. That means we can build more houses, we can give more well served letters to businesses. It's positive for us. We worked on it, well, 25 or 30 years, but finally it's happening. The second thing is Steve Perez, former supervisor here in Kern County, turned 70 yesterday. And he wasn't at the meeting. He was at his birthday party. <laughs> Up in Idaho, fishing. Okay. And the third thing in Roseman is our 28 new classrooms for our middle school. We broke ground. $21 million. This will accommodate the uh, influx of kids that are in kindergarten coming up. So we're happy about that. So Roseman is growing. Thank you again to the county for money for the pool. And uh, any questions? 
Thank you. Thank you. To have to be. All right. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how since uh, apparently QR codes are all rage today. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I, I, I think Dr. Hart's going to have a QR. Code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, you know, I, want, I do want to talk a little bit about technology because that's kind of the theme. To recap 2022, some of the techn technological advances that happened that I expect to be trends uh, for the city of Tehachapi this coming year. Um, first of all, uh, really just in how we, we shop and, and eat for the most part. You know, we had our uh, you know, Chipotle open right before the end of the year. They have their new you know, Chipotle Lane Express where it's not your traditional drive through You order on your app and you pick it up. Um, it probably, I'm kind of predicting it's going to be the new, like the drive through squawk box is going to go away completely. This will be the new way because of the technology. Um, and so these restaurants now can market directly to you. They know what you order. You can order what you always like. You have to go do it over and over again. And so I think that's one of the um, technological things we'll see advance with, with QSR restaurants um, as opposed to the traditional drive through uh, Also, you know, we're kind of behind, I guess, out here, especially in the smaller communities when it comes to the technology of deliveries. Uh, a lot of businesses now are going away from delivery drivers and they go directly with DoorDash, Uber Eats. Uh, we have those companies now in Tehachapi operating and some businesses no longer, like Roundtable Pizza that opened last year, they don't hire them delivery people, they just work with DoorDash. So expect more of that as well. Uh, our Walmart, who always had that sort of pickup in your car, they now deliver directly from the store in Tehachapi to homes. Uh, which is good in, in a sense because it's their way to compete with Amazon. It's always been their way to compete with Amazon. Amazon has to build big distribution centers. Walmart's always said our store is our distribution center. And so they pull that off the shelves directly out of the store into Hatchby. So that is good news for the city because that can focus as, as a sale from that store, even if it goes to uh, somewhere outside of the, uh, the city limits. So uh, that is definitely something we're kind of keeping tabs on and seeing how that technology evolves. Uh, we continue to use uh, location-based AI data for our uh, site selection, uh, we're able to take, you know, we talk about matching businesses with the right location. Uh, we can run a void analysis of that location and find out the demographics of people that like said store and if that store will fit there, you know, based on a bunch of factors and that sort of thing. It helps us figure out who's shopping where, what communities are coming from, uh, you know, what percentage of people come from you know, Mojave or California City to catch me to shop based on a store. So we can see all that. Um, we've been using it for a couple years now, really ramped it up last year, continue to evolve on it. Uh, we did recently receive a Kern Cog Award of Merit for Innovation, and we'll get that award uh, March 2nd in, in Bakersfield. So we continue to monitor and use that AI data uh, moving forward. Uh, we've got a sort of micro economy that really took off in 2022, and I expect more growth. Um, that's a micro economy that took off as a result of our wine industry and our micro brews. Um, all the wineries and taste rooms are outside the city, but using the AI stuff, you can see the impact that they have on the city with people coming in to eat after you know, they go to a winery or maybe shopping. Um, so we're seeing that stuff, and, and it's also developed. There's been a couple of businesses that have opened up as a result of that industry. There's two tour companies, other wine tour companies. They're based in the city. They open little gift shops as well. Um, and so that, that's developed on that realm, but also they're now entertainment destinations. So these wineries, these microbreweries, they're bringing in touring musical acts, uh, comedians, people that were on their way from Phoenix to Fresno and they book a date in Tehachapi at you know, a winery or uh, they do a comedy show at a microbrewery now because it's, it's kind of along the way now. So we're seeing that evolve and of course some of these groups have hotel stays involved and, and of course meals and that sort of thing. So uh, it's good, it's created a new genre for us and uh, we've been able to see some benefit. Um, on the housing trends, uh, the trend for 2023 is going to be a diversity in housing types offered. There are three condo style developments approved in 2022. Probably we'll see one or two of them maybe start breaking ground in 2023. Um, and also uh, one of our long planned, uh, planned developments, uh, Sage Ranch, they've got a lot of different housing types. They are actually, they've submitted their first phase and there's been some notes back and forth and they're working on corrections. So they may be moving some infrastructure ground in 2023 as well. And that big part of that first phase is townhomes, which will be another uh, diverse sort of different housing type. Um, and then a more traditional single family neighborhood, uh, Cahill Manian, a pretty big national merchant builder. It's got 13 on the ground in Tehachapi Hills now. Um, nine are sold. They start at about 525 because the cost of housing, this goes back to the conversation about housing. 
unfortunately, you know, unicorns and rainbows don't pay the bills in the housing industry, especially in California, where uh, even though there's a need for housing in said communities, the builder, the state of California said you have to have solar, the new code cycle includes mandatory EV charging in the garage, all these things add to the cost of the, the home, and a home builder is in it to make a living, and so therefore it's hard to match some of these, especially in communities with lower income level, to get the money. The return on investment is just not there by the time you build infrastructure, build roads, and get water figured out and all that stuff, and then do everything the state wants you to do, and then all of a sudden you're looking at a very, very slim profit margin. And then the cost of materials went up last year, lumber's been up and down, and so it's really hard. And so they have to even, even to see, I mean, that's why these, these KHO homes in Tehachapi, 525 for a track home is nuts, but that's what it's costing them to make any money, and we are seeing people paying it, but that's been a big part of the drive. So it's, it's tough to build in, you know, in communities right now, especially smaller communities, because the state's made it very cost prohibitive uh, for builders to do so. They, the state and the governor keeps funding housing, 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 and every code cycle that comes out has more and more requirements, you know, no gas, all electric, and all these things that make the cost of uh, building more expensive. Uh, 2022, there were 111 single home sales <laughs> in the city of Tehachapi. Average price was 373, uh, and the year before there were 145 sales, and the average price was 327. So I think similar to what California City said earlier, fewer sales, but the prices increased. That's kind of due to the, the supply issues. Um, so despite the interest rates and that sort of thing, which is also having a big impact, uh, we're still seeing interest and a demand for homes. Uh, in the city, and um, and and they're continuing to uh, to sell a little bit. Predicted in 2021 into 22 was this sort of need for, um, and we've seen a lot of them come to fruition. Uh, we developed a short-term rental ordinance in 2022 um, to deal with your Airbnbs, your VRBOs, um, and we have we had a lot of applications in 2022. So what that ordinance basically did was make the homeowners get an inspection for safety. Uh, if they, per our ordinance for hotels basically, they offer lodging for five or more, they pay the same ho uh, hotel tax uh, that the uh, hotel rooms pay, and they have to get a business license, um, they have to keep on file contact information, that way it doesn't become a party house. If it does, and the police come a few times, they lose their ability to operate. Uh, I'm really surprised about how many, there's about a dozen now. Some go from maybe a single room to full homes. Uh, being uh, being offered and some people realize that we actually chatted to a couple that came in that were renting an entire home and they inherited the home from a, a parent and they didn't want who was moving somewhere else and they didn't want to sell it and pay capital gains taxes and so they just basically rent it as a short-term rental and since we have a lot of construction folks that are in and out for weeks at a time uh, they seem to be doing okay so we did uh, set an arbitrary limit as well in neighborhoods that way we don't have a street of 10 homes and seven become Airbnbs. It's not gonna happen, We're kind of controlling where they may go uh, to keep the sort of single family neighborhood uh, intact. And so, um, yeah, that's basically it for the city of Tehachapi. So, thank you. Any questions for Corey? Yes. Just one question about the, the last thing you discussed. Um, kind of something similar. Do you guys have a tracking system that can be, uh, that is public? We're, we're actually, working on doing something like that, trying to see how you guys are navigating. For the short-term rentals? For, for the short-term rentals, but so that people can see, hey, I want to rent from this place. Have they violated the ordinance? Oh, before? gotcha. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I talked to initially, because there's a couple of companies out there that offer, and they'll actually even, they even do compliance in terms of like, they'll mine the internet for people that don't have a license, and then they'll peg them and let you, uh, you know, let you know what's going on. Um, we didn't think initially that we'd have that many. I still think it's pretty controllable within staff, but uh, yeah, our ordinance, we had it written by a group, that, uh, a law firm that does this a lot, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty strict in terms of uh, control, and if we have a couple calls, like they won't even be, basically what'll happen is they, that license will go away. So it won't really be a need for a potential lessee to want to look into that, because it just won't be operating, so. Um, yeah, so we kind of keep it in house for now, um, but I know some larger cities, and maybe for the county, a service might might be best. There's also pretty good. <coughs> so first we had the neighborhood landlords, and then we had the undigger woman, there's good man. Now we have a male female combination of the Hatchby. Greg or Susan, do either of you have anything to contribute? Uh, great job. Corey did a great job. Corey did a great job. Corey's asking for a raise, right? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I do have to take a Oh, yes, we're not done. <laughs> but my cohort here, there is a sign in sheet on the back table. So please make sure you sign in before you leave. Just proof to Richard I came here and did this. Yeah, because otherwise it doesn't have any proof. We don't have it on the all Member comments. I'm going to start at that corner of the room with a name that usually waits to the very last because it's W for waste management. But this time I'm going by the first name. So Ashley, do you have any comments? <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I think I just I want to reiterate that the as I'm seeing with and all the cities can attest to it that the state is crashing down on, on our cities and um, in regards to implementing SB 1383, um, we were having weekly, monthly calls with them, so they're not going away and they're just ramping up and there's different agencies that are kind of attacking us from all angles, so I um, just want to put that out there that it is, despite inflation, despite, you know, all kinds of things going on, they kind of don't really care, and they, they want you to implement something, so this year will be heavy handed if you don't have a, a third container, um, if you don't have an organic container for your food waste and green waste, that will be coming very soon in county and city, and then, um, you know, just going through and, and coming up with a plan. So we're working closely with the cities, but I just wanted to say that the state is really cracking down. Um, they have no rewards for anything going on around us, and so we're just going to have to keep working together to accomplish those goals. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. County? Yes, we have a big one. Oh, yeah. we do. So we um, are really excited. I don't know if I've talked to, I can't remember if I've talked to you about it, but we we are hosting our first, hopefully annual, um, East Kern Career Expo. We're partnering with the Economic Development, Fa Development Foundation um, to make this happen. And so what we're really trying to do is support and encourage students, sixth graders to 12th graders in East Kern County. So we are hitting all of your areas. We have invited all of your schools, uh, from middle school to high school, um, to come to the Mojave Air and Space Park on March 3rd. And we will have over 50 vendors in this space and really um, hoping to create awareness, create exposure, create experiences for your students in your, in your community to be able to know what kind of jobs and careers are in your community. So we're really, really excited about it. This is the first one, so we feel like we're climbing up a hill of molasses trying to get this going. So we are really also here to kind of tug at your heartstrings and say, please help us support your students. Um, this is a free event for your students. We at the County Office of Ed are able to hopefully overcome any barrier that might exist. Um, so what we really want to communicate is number one, if you know a middle school or high school and those kids haven't heard about this event, please have them be bugging their administrators. Say, why are we invited to this? Why are we coming to this? Are we coming to this? I want to make sure we're coming to this. Number two, um, industry partners. So I said we have over 50 um, exhibitors coming. Those spots aren't filled. We just have 50 spots. So we would love to have whatever organizations, um, industry, companies, whoever, to come and host a booth at this event. It is a free way to host. You'll get a free lunch. It's on March 3rd um, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Like I said, it's at the Mojave Air and Space Port. Um, and really, we just want to, kind of like Alexia said, we just want to help build that talent to industry pipeline. So we're hoping that this is an annual event. Um, like I said, it's free of charge. We want to help and kind of make this a really easy, seamless process. I have um, a flyer that I really would love you all to take. This has the information on it. It also has a QR code. <laughs> if, you, um, if you would like, if your organization or your industry or your company wants to sign up to be a vendor, like I said, it's free. You have to register at this QR code, code or there is a website here. I'm also going to leave my business card if you guys have any questions reach out. I'm the director of the program, so I'm kind of hopefully facilitating this, but um, like I said, we're really excited about it and really excited about what this could do for our students in East Kern County. Any questions? And Rio Tinto is our first exhibitor. 
Please reach out, don't hesitate. Thank you. Now, I also do want to announce that the state of the state of the county, Rio Tinto, is our big sponsor. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, obviously, the thread is QR codes. So, okay. maybe we need to think of an Eastern Economic Alliance QR codes. Yeah. I'm 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 Potential increase in personnel and uh, projects that both kind of and get Some of them might make the announcement today. Thank you know, and I thank you for that. Dave's been sitting here, he's not on Monday, which I'm going to complain <laughs> to our boss about. I miss China Lake. When I went to Ridgecrest, I miss China Lake. We didn't have anything specific, but I, I'm not sure who the question. I heard there might be some announcement today about a substantial increase in personnel and uh, working projects at both China Lake and Edwards in the near future. Yeah, if there was going to be, we aren't aware of it. However, the budget, the budget was passed at the very right the end of the year when that omnibus of the 1.7 trillion, uh, 1.7 trillion also did include a lot more uh, earthquake recovery funding. For example, it was 41 million above what was requested before that was to cover the uh, cost of supply, supply chain, uh, supply of themselves, and the uh, inflation in general. And that's that's a function of, of something in addition to the, to the 2.5 billion in major military construction funds that were assigned in, in uh, 20 and 21. Um, this this continuation of five years of each uh, funding is due each year, and we have to compete for it each year to complete outfitting the buildings and the personnel. So, for example, some of that would be per, uh, if they finish hangers for this year, and they are most of the most of the work is going to be completed over the next two years. It's all on schedule, um, and they're going to be starting uh, some of the big branch of ribbon cuttings. Uh, this year, probably next month, with the, uh, the joint common capability group. That's been postponed one month. But though all those, most of those have equipment that go inside them, but if you purchased it you know, four years ago when we first got funding to start the earthquake, the warranties would be expired. And yet we have to justify Congress every year. <coughs> and why do you need one? Maybe, you know, that's, that's our but way back then. We're roughly at the full billion. So, uh, and I know <coughs> there were these starts in that, but if you don't know everything that's in it yet, I don't need one of the leadership until next Tuesday, and I should have an update at that time. But they were already short employers. They needed, they were at 800 employees hired to be hired. It, it's true across all the airspace industry, but China Lake in particular. And I know associated with that, um, they're going to do a joint hiring pair that haven't announced this yet they coordinated with the city and some others in the next couple months that we will do jointly and it'll be the first time we think maybe what there's been a cooperative effort to do that. Um, the other thing we got we did get some additional monies for wastewater treatment facility eligibility in our budget that will allow us to fly in the FY uh, 24 uh, that we weren't on before uh, before and that that helps solve our water problem our number one problem for the base and for the community because 90% of the workers on the base reside down in the community. Um, let's see, there were a couple other quick things that don't answer your question specifically, but give us some background. Uh, who was it that mentioned, uh, let's see, I think you mentioned B3K and the industry, uh, talent industry pipeline. 
We've actually had the community urologists and ecologists and the school districts go out and do on-site visits on base, and in their words, I pulled up with uh, Sean Hancock from uh, Saratoga, we shut up and listened for a change. Mm -hmm. What do you need? What kind of programs do you need? What kind of folks do you want to recruit? And they're holding, they held one of those meetings with all uh, of these current uh, suppliers, China Lake, the educational suppliers. I think the next one, the Lexigo? Yeah, I think, I think they're working on one at Edwards and also one at Mojave that will follow that because those are the three groups that are involved in the aerospace technologies group. Uh, a third thing related to this, the only the California has redistricted out of the, out of the uh, send in or the uh, 10 year census. And Kevin McCarthy, Speaker McCarthy now, uh, his district was changed. We, he has been hosting a Friday, every Friday, we have a meeting with it, it's tomorrow, by the way, called the Eastern Sierra uh, Aerospace Technologies Group. And it, kind of, it includes a lot of the people that have been talked about here. Baker, uh, B3K has been pulled into that. With the modifications of Kevin's district, Lemoore, Naval Air Station of Lemoore, is now in his district. They're going to be joining, it, and they are really the customers of China Lake and somewhat uh, and also <coughs> service things that they do together. They'll be on the call tomorrow morning. So we're adding, adding them into the aerospace technologies group, which is a part of uh, the B one of the uh, four pillars. There's five pillars in the BPK, four of them are, are industry sectors. The fifth one is support for overall. So that's going to be the increase. And on that call, what's different uh, from that group is we get all the, the uh, state senators and representatives and their staffs that are not necessarily in, in you know, we've got a smorgasbord support of districts at the state and uh, at the state level, particularly for the assembly and the Senate that aren't in a meeting like this. So we get the ones covered the lane test, for example. Um, uh, the state reps, actually the Congress, uh, federal Congress, and we also get the state Senate, Senator Wilkie, et cetera, Bernard, Nick Sandberg, and everyone, they're in there. So they can help us as we identify partnering opportunities uh, and work on the legislative language that we may need changed at a national level to do, let's say, a, a government industry partnering, partnering um, innovation center, which is one that we're working on with Edwards and China Lake and Mojave and India Current Airport. For, uh, startup entrepreneurs to do something and be able to fly on the ranges for the facilities. They don't have to be located physically on the ranges where they have all this access issues. Their workforce coming on and going off, they can be off the site like at, at Mojave or Indian or Foxfield or somewhere and yet they do a lot of flying. This is unmanned vehicle stuff, for example. It's an innovation hub to explore this. We've got another meeting on that tomorrow morning also. So. These are some of the things that are happening behind the scenes, and I'll give a plug to B3K. Because one thing we didn't have in Eastern Kern was a lot of funding behind these kind of efforts. And B3K, when, when they did their research bookings, and, and by the way, B3K was also funded by Bakersfield, mm -hmm. Chamber of I'm sorry, but yeah, Chamber of Commerce uh, of Bakersfield. That wasn't mentioned, I don't think. But I was just lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, the government business partner. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> they, there has, there was no funding behind those efforts. Like, uh, put a central site for folks could come in and see what was available at China Lake, which is proud of being known as the Secret City, or it was both of them had huge security issues, and a lot of people don't know what goes on out there, what's available. Uh, to them, and so making that available to them, exposing it to them, having a place for industry startups and others to come in and speak to uh, base employers, uh, base uh, user providers uh, for the uh, research and development, and most importantly, the test facilities, is something that there's money on the table for B3K to do this. So there's leadership. They, uh, sorry, Alexia is gone. My understanding is. When we met last Friday on this, they hired a project lead to do this who was a very senior person and would be recognizable to some 
in the room by, by virtue of what they just did to take over the leadership of this innovation hub. So there's there's a lot of potential good news that's, that's akin to what you asked the question about, but not specific. It's not, I, mean, I can't give you specific numbers. But there's a possibility that a lot of this these funds could be used for housing, both in Ridgecrest to to take care of the personnel that will be coming in. No. Since they're no longer doing housing on the uh, base. Yeah, unfortunately, so no. We need more housing for personnel. Yeah, we already know housing shortage, just like uh, Mojave talked about here. Uh, and that's one of the big challenges in the communities. The investors, Corey touched it perfectly on it, the investors don't want to put their money at risk for a lower payoff in our communities than they can get for the same cost of, of uh, development. We have many plans, Ron can talk about this or Megan, we have at least three multifamily um, facilities fully designed with our planning commission, and they, the developers could not get uh, investors to fund them because it's too risky and they don't get a high enough payoff. One of the attractions of our community is we cost less than LA, but the construction cost is the same high or higher because of transportation. So that's the catch-22 we're in, and the government will not will not guarantee those jobs for what we're hiring on, on base. But some of those industry partners, commercial guys, that, that do start to agree with the government can agree to commitments with, uh, with a developer and an investor. So we've been working on this one for five years. We'll keep working on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is really hard, and California is not helping. In fact, it's getting worse as he says every year. With regards to this, and our big need up there is single family, I'm sorry, multi-family housing. It's the young professionals we're trying to recruit in the community, and right now, there are many of them forced to join up and buy a house. Because we can get single family housing, they can take that risk, because it is the, the trade off works. If you get four or five of them together, they can pay at the market uh, based price that will be competitive and give the investor money back, or give the investor their piece. Thank you. I've got so many ideas, but I think I've got three people in the room that haven't spoken. Sitting next to Justin? Yeah. Nothing? Is that you, Mark? No, I mean, you keep taking Jay. Jay. Oh, <laughs> Jay, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Jay Lacey, I'm with Sony Talk. Yeah, this is um, a guy. But one major update uh, we just have our economic development rate discount. Um, uh, some of you may not have been aware, um, it did expire um, back in September, so we were working hard and diligently to have that discount. Basically what it is, is a, a discount we use for businesses, whether we're trying to attract them or retain or expand their um, services in our service territories. Um, that had expired, um, but I'm happy to announce that in December, right before Christmas, which is a Christmas miracle, um, mm -hmm. we had it reinstated, so we're able to offer that incentive. So for those that are not aware, it's a 12% discount that we do offer for businesses that can qualify for that rate. So um, if you know of any businesses that can take advantage of it, I actually do have some um, in this area, in this region, that are um, applying for that discount. Um, feel free to let me know. I do have some cards on me, so I'd be happy to uh, share that information with you. Other than that, um, I'm available for any questions you may have. I want your card because I see that our chief of people is going to you Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm over at Economic Workforce Development for the county. And I'm sure Richard has talked about this many times with this meeting, but we are currently operating a micro grant program for small businesses. That's micro businesses plus 25 employees. Um, they're eligible to receive up to $2,500. It does not have to be repaid. And so if you know any small businesses that were affected by COVID-19 that are struggling to keep their doors open, or even if they're not struggling, just to try to help them out, um, we do have that program available. KBC is a partner on it, SBBC is a partner on it, CAPK, which is um, mm -hmm. also a partner on it, and we also have Williams Business Center of um, Bakersfield. They're all partnering in order to um, do outreach and make sure that we're giving this program 
or not to everybody, but it will be expiring shortly, so I would recommend to anyone who's needing funding um, to apply immediately so that we can get those funds out to them. Is there a website you can go to? Um, You've got it. Any of our, yeah, any of, any of the partnering agencies' websites should have information about the program and you should be able to get an application from them. And it's fine because it's a really, like, it's a one-page application. I think it's actually too technically one and a half to signature, but it's a super easy application. They only have to provide a business license and a copy of the driver. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's a really easy program. We support it's kind of like care drivers and small businesses. But yeah. Like so it is available throughout the entire county. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is to call our American Job Center. We do have a number of workforce supports that are available for businesses, such as on the job training contracts, sometimes work experience contracts, depending on what you're doing. Uh, we can also partner with our local education provider to do custom training for them. So if you're coming in for a very technical, um, you mentioned the Manufacturers Alliance, uh, working with um, BC through their um, manufacturing training. We can offer to literally put together a customized training for them at their site and also do on-the-job training as a follow-up backup. We're um, kicking off a grant right now for healthcare workers. That's kicking off the circus, so our first cohort will be going through. That is for healthcare workers in every level of healthcare. So we'll be um, working on that too. So if you have healthcare providers in the area that are in need of workforce, let us know and we'd be happy to work with them as well. Oh, that's it. Did we lose anything? Okay, we have a special prize for everybody that spotted all the mistakes we made. <laughs> there were not nobody spotted them. So we'll tell Richard he can stay in Boston. <laughs> Okay, here we go.